Fishing. Many people enjoy this sport and I can see why. Just being outdoors is a wonderful part about fishing. Man, what a day. Hey, I think I got a nibble. Fishing is a multi-billion dollar industry and in Florida, over six billion dollars in revenue are generated each year. We are talking millions of recreational fishers. Did you ever think about the impacts of all those people catching fish? That's a lot of lines in the water. Welcome to Living Green. Hello, my name is Mark Hostetler, and on today's show, we are going to talk about sustainable fishing. Many species that are caught by recreational fishing are declining. For example, scientists found that snapper, grouper, and grunt populations have decreased around Florida. These fish were particularly scarce in sites close to large coastal cities. There, both the number and size of fish have diminished. Scientists estimate that for some species, 80% of the mortality is from recreational fishing. Therefore, whether one keeps or properly releases a fish can directly impact fish populations. Plus, fishing can cause other problems beyond the direct impacts on the fish. For example, fishing line can entangle birds, causing injury or death. On today's show, we will discuss environmental issues surrounding fishing. First, we'll spend some time offshore on a boat catching, we hope, some fish. On the boat, we will discuss proper catch and release techniques and what to do when releasing fish brought up from deep water. Next, we'll talk about the dangers of fishing line to wildlife and proper disposal of it. We'll finish by discussing the dangers of feeding fish to birds and how to remove fishing line or hooks from pelicans. Oh, I got this one. Come on. Go. Oh, come on. To learn more about sustainable fishing, we traveled to Cedar Key where we rented a boat to go offshore. Cedar Key is a small town located on the Gulf of Mexico in Florida. The town is a unique mixture of shops, art and antique galleries, and restaurants. Residents and tourists regularly visit the wharf either to launch their boats or to take a stroll along the avenue. People come from all around to watch wildlife, go fishing, sightsee, and just relax. It's 7.30 in the morning and we're loading up the boat to go fishing offshore. We've assembled a team of scientists from the University of Florida to help us learn more about fish and proper catch and release techniques. Well, I hope the weather holds out and we catch lots of fish. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay, we're loaded and ready to go. Captain, take us to the fish. We are going approximately 22 miles offshore to several fishing spots where we expect to catch grouper, snapper, and other saltwater fish. The captain of this boat is Captain Al, and he is driving a research vessel, the Discovery, associated with the Department of Zoology at the University of Florida. have assembled quite a team of people from the University of Florida. First up is Dr. Chuck Jacoby, an estuarine ecologist. Chuck is going to help us with proper catch and release techniques and what kinds of tackles to use when catching fish. Next is Dr. Daryl Parkin, a fish research biologist. He conducts research on offshore fish populations. 
Daryl brought the fishing equipment for this expedition and is responsible for taking us, well, to the fish. In fact, Daryl works closely with another fish biologist, Doug Colley, and they know the gulf really well and have the numbers or GPS locations to catch the grouper and other reef fish. Dr. Chuck Adams, the other Chuck, is a marine economist and he is going to demonstrate how to vent fish that are brought up from depth. Chuck, along with Sea Grant agent Don Sweat, are promoting venting as a method to increase the survival of fish that are released. Okay, we're about halfway out there, and what we're doing here is catching some bait fish. So, uh, the people behind me are having poles in the water, and we're catching little fish to catch the really big fish. Here, we baited some hooks with frozen squid to catch some small fish. These fish will eventually be used as live bait for grouper. Thus, with lines in the water, we waited. Hmm, I was beginning to wonder if I could even catch a small bait fish. Here we go. Look at that. Look at that monster. Woo! All right. Okay, I'm done. Let's go home. <laughs> After placing the bait fish in the coolers, we packed up and headed out towards deeper water. Doug and Daryl begin to look at their numbers, or GPS coordinates. They picked out some good numbers and gave these to the captain to take us out to some good fishing spots, or at least we hope. So we made it out here. Before we put the lines in the water, we need the appropriate tackle. To learn more about what type of tackle to use, we're going to talk with Dr. Chuck Jacoby here. Well, uh, today we're going to use some live bait. And so one of the things we use with live bait is what's called a circle hook. And what that helps do is keep the fish from getting hooked in the throat or in the gut, which means that when you release them, their survival rate is much higher. The concept is that the circle hook could twist and hook into the corner of their mouth as you reel it in. So that helps a lot. The other thing we have with us is various kinds of gear for de-hooking. This is one kind of de-hooker that we brought along. And the concept behind that is to try to get the fish de-hooked, and if you're going to release it back in the water as quickly as possible, keep the stress levels down. Likewise, when we gear up, we bring the right kind of lines and leaders with us so that we can bring the fish aboard as quickly as possible and, again, keep its stress levels down. So what's the problem when you actually handle the fish? Is there, I mean, is there a length of time or is there something wrong when you actually handle it with your hands? Well, the whole idea is to try to keep the handling to a minimum. If you can handle it with wet hands, that helps. The slime on the fish actually protects it from bacterial infections. And so you try to keep that from getting scraped off. So let's say uh, for some reason you don't use a circle hook and actually the hook goes down the throat. How can you remove the hook safely with those type of fish? Well, sometimes you can't actually get the hook out. Um, so your best bet is just cut that leader as close to the hook as you can and leave the hook in. In addition to the hook removal tool, you want to have a venting tool if you are fishing in deep water. We'll talk more about this, but sometimes you need to let the air out of the fish to help it get back down to depth. Okay, we made it out here and uh, we got the poles in the water and we're waiting for the fish and hopefully we're going to get some grouper.
first fish brought up was a gag grouper. The size limit for this fish is 22 inches in the gulf with a bag limit of five per person. Wow, what a beautiful fish. Daryl caught a red grouper. Now the size for this fish is 20 inches in the gulf with a bag limit of one per person. Here, you can see the circle hook lodged in the corner of the mouth. This is typical and you rarely gut hook fish with circle hooks. If this fish were under the limit, one could easily remove the hook and release the fish. In some cases, fish are brought up from such a depth that their swim bladder bursts and gas escapes into their body cavity. The pressure can be so great that it can actually push the stomach out of the mouth as seen in this snapper. With this grouper, the stomach is really pushed out of his mouth. If you do not release the gas from the cavity by venting, then the fish cannot go below the surface and it will die. To learn more about how to vent a fish, Chuck Adams demonstrates with a grouper he caught. These fish are being brought up from about 43 feet, so they're under a bit more pressure than they are here at the, at, at the surface, so as they come up, the gases in their swim bladder is going to be expanding. If they're brought up from too far of a depth, that swim bladder will actually rupture. The gases are in the, are in the body cavity and sometimes it'll push the stomach out and push organs out the anus here. In this case, that's not the, that, that hasn't happened. It's not that dramatic. The barotrauma is not that bad. But this one is slightly distended. And so this fish, uh, if we were going to release it, the idea would be you'd want to vent that, get that gas out of the fish so it would have an easier time getting back down to depth. Otherwise, it's like trying to push a beach ball down under the water. So in this case, what we'll do is demonstrate how to, how to vent this fish. I'll use a very simple tool. We have a couple of different types here. This one is a little bit smaller, hypodermic needle with a, without the plunger in it. And what you would do is lay this pectoral fin down on the body like this. And at this point right here, right in this area here is the body cavity. And to vent that gas out, you just simply put the needle under a scale and insert it barely under the skin into the body cavity, and that air will then rush through the needle and out this uh, syringe here. While we did catch some legal fish, some were under the limit, and Chuck Jacoby demonstrates how to release a fish. So first we have to get the hook out of him, which is a circle hook, so it's right in the corner of the mouth. Try not to handle him as little as possible handle him. The slime on the fish actually keeps them from getting infections. And we want to take him over to the side and put him in head first. 